Good evening. Thank you for joining us here at Central Church of Christ for our Wednesday evening Bible class. I hope you'll join with me tonight as we study in Romans chapter 7. I hope your week has been going well and that you're ready tonight to uh, study together. If you have any announcements, just please let me or one of our elders know and we'll get it announced at our next appointed time. Go ahead and open up your Bibles to Romans chapter 7, but before we begin, let's start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this opportunity tonight to worship you, to study your word, and to uh, look for guidance on how to be better disciples and better examples of you. I pray that you'll open up our hearts and our minds to be focused and to learn what we need to learn. I pray all these things through your Son. Amen. Now, Paul continues chapter 7 from his arguments in chapter 6. He is still going to be dealing with how we are to deal with sin and what saves us. But now he is focused on the role of the old law in all of this. Read with me, if you will, in verse 1. Or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives? For a married woman is bound by law to her, to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law, and if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers... You also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions, aroused by the law, were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to which held us captive, so that we serve the new way of the Spirit, and not in the old way of the written code. Paul begins this passage with one main idea that he is trying to get across. We have died to the law. That is his vo focus for verses 1 through 6, about how the law has served its purpose, but also how about it's been put away. Now, we must remember that Paul is talking about the old law or the Old Testament. And he starts this point by telling us how the law binds us. The law is only binding in life. Paul teaches this point by comparing it to marriage. He reminds us that marriage is only binding on the two parties while they are both living. If one of the spouses die, then the other is free to remarry. Yet if one of the spouses has not died, and the other one has intimate relations with someone other than their spouse, they have become an adulterer. His point is simple. The law is like this, only binding through life. Now this is important because it outlines the limitations of the law and the necessity of the new one. The law only applies to those who are living under it and has no control or impact on those without it. That is why the new law was needed, because we needed a law that was encompassing of all people. And that is where Paul goes to next. In order for this to apply to us, because we have not died, Paul explains to us again the importance of Christ, that we are dead to the law through Christ. We died to the law, therefore annulling it through Jesus' death. That means you and I have no need to physically die for the old law because Jesus has already fulfilled that part for us on the cross. But why is this important? He died so that we could belong to a better new law, so that we can bear fruit for God. That is why this is important. The old law has its purpose, and it was served. But the new law under Christ allows us to be fruitful servants to God because we do not have the limitations of the old law holding us down. And Paul reiterates that in verses 5 through 6, that while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from that law, having died to that which held us captive. He's reminding us that when we're baptized, we were, were, were putting to death the old self. We're crucifying our old self, which was captive to sin, and we are rising anew to a life that has not been captivated by sin. Because of Christ's death, we have been released to serve this new law which, as we know, was established upon the cross. In the flesh, sinful passions were aroused and put to work in our lives because the law highlighted them and brought them out of the darkness that they were in. The law set them to work within our lives because it made known what sin was and what it was not. But because of Christ's death, we have been released from the old law and our inability to keep it and have the new law to serve, which is the way of the Spirit. By telling us that the new law is of the Spirit, he was reminding us that under the new law, we are not saved by what we do or the checklist we might keep, but we are saved by the faith that we have, which brings the Spirit of God to dwell within us. The new law surpasses the old law, which was a written, codified word, because now if we have faith, we are saved in Jesus, 
This releases us from the bounds of the old and opens up the new law to serve. So we have died to the law through Jesus' death and have a new law to live under. And after establishing the purpose of this new law, Paul has to deal with a whole new question. Read with me in verse 7, if you will. What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law. But when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be a death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Paul now has to deal with this new can of worms. If the old law showed us sin in our lives, does that make the law sin? And we can imagine how this question came about. After a few chapters of telling us what happened with sin and the old law, and how the old law served to lighten the lighten sin in our lives, I mean, enlighten it, it could be construed that the old law then served no good but sin itself. It must be sin if all it did was illuminate sin. But Paul is swift to answer this. By no means is this sin. Just because the old law illuminated sin in our lives, it does not make it sinful. In fact, Paul is very blunt in the defense of this law using the same phrase he used to open chapter 6. By no means. There is no way that the law is sin. Just because the law shows us what sin is, it does not make it sinful. We would not know what was wrong if we were not told what was wrong or what was right. Think of it this way. If we, when we're driving, had no speed limit sign around us, how would we know if we were going too fast? We wouldn't. We wouldn't know because there would be nothing to tell us that we were wrong or right regarding the speed in which we took. That's what the old law does. The old law merely showed the people what was sin. It was, a, it was for the people who became sinful because they were recognized to allow sin to reign in their lives and to control them. And that's where Paul goes next in this opening passage. That the law was not sin, but once illuminated in our lives, sin seized its opportunity to control us. Once we're told about sin and what it is, it can control us and take over. Paul uses the example of covetousness here. Before he had been taught about it, he had no clue what it was. But once taught about covetousness, sin saw the opportunity it has to produce covetousness in him, and it took a hold. If you or I had no idea what sin was, it would have no control in our lives. But once we are told what sin is, it has an opportunity to play a major role in our lives, to control us and drive us to wickedness instead of righteousness. Because once we're told of sin, once we're, no, once we're told you shouldn't do that, well, then the thought starts to creep in. Well, what if we do that? What if we just do it a little? What if we let it creep in just a small bit? Without the law, as Paul is saying, sin is dead because there's no, nothing to illuminate what sin is. We even have life outside of the law because there is no sin. We don't know what's right or wrong, so therefore we can't be living wrongfully. But once the law came, and recognition of sin came with it, we died because sin was illuminated in our lives. The law is not sin. And in fact, Paul tells us what the law is and how different it is from sin. He tells us that, in very simple terms, the law itself is holy. The law teaches us what sin is. It does not create sin. The law is from God. Therefore, it is holy and righteous and good. And once we recognize that, and, and once we see that, then we understand that we cannot attribute sin to God. Because if we do, doubts may creep in. Doubts may arise and create further problems in our own faith and walk that don't need to be there. The law is holy. We are the ones who fail and mar the work of God. The law is righteous and good. We are the ones who are wicked and bad. God created the law for a purpose, and yet we failed it. But Paul then goes on to continue. He says, or we, the questions, you know, creep in. What then? What do we, why do we need the law? Why do we fall short? What's the purpose? And if you look with me in verse 13, Paul does a great job of answering this question. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. 
it was sin producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment we might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For if I do not what do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Paul has another question to answer here. If the law was good, does it bring death to me? And his point is very simple. Sin is shown to be sin. The law does not bring death to us. By no means does it bring death to us. So how do we fall? And how do we have death as an end to our choices? His main point is just simple enough. The law shows sin to be sin. And in order to teach us that point, he tells us where the fault lies. He begins by telling us again that it is not the law that fails because the law is spiritual from God. That is important for us to nail down in our minds, because if we don't, we may begin to question God and his will. The law does not bring death to me. Had the Israelites been faithful to God's will and law, they would have been rewarded with life. But because they failed, their sin separated themselves and brings them death. The law is what brings life, yet sin, once it sees the opportunity within us, brings death. And again, this goes to the point of the matter, being that the law only shows sin for what it is. That's what the law is designed to do. And it does it very well. So what does separate us? Well, Paul tells us in verse 14, it is our flesh that is sinful. It is my physical actions and my fleshly desire that I give into that makes me sinful. The law is spiritual. My flesh is sinful. Paul then has to deal with the major mind twister of this chapter. And we're going to do our best to deal with and understand what he's saying. Paul begins by saying that it is not that he has a desire to do good but not the ability. He begins this by saying that, that what sounds very confusing, but simple. He says that he does not do what he wants to do, but he does what he hates. And on the flip side, when he does what he does not want to do, then he agrees with the law and it makes it good. Now this does sound confusing, but it helped me to look at a translation that really serves more as a commentary. It's a translation known as the message, but I find it easy to understand because it, it makes it more uh, simple in terms of what he's saying. And here's what it said. I can anticipate the response that is coming. I know that all God's commands are spiritual, but I am not. Isn't this also your experience? Yes, I'm full of myself. After all, I've spent a long time in sin's prison. What I don't understand about myself is that I decide one way, but then I act another, doing things I absolutely despise. So if I can't be trusted to figure it out, what is best for me, and then do it, it becomes obvious that God's command is necessary. And we're going to pause there before we get on, continue. What this author is saying is simple. That we've all had this experience where we want to do one thing, but yet our body or our, our, our actions take us to do another. Think about it this way. If we set in our mind and say, well, I'm going to do good. I'm not going to eat a, a chocolate bar that's sitting out on the counter. Yet we keep passing that chocolate bar. and We keep seeing it. And all of a sudden, the next thing we know, we've unwrapped it. We've started to eat it. Well, we've done what we decided we weren't going to do because our, our body chose to do so. But then he goes on to continue and say, he says, But I need something more. For if I know the law, but still can't keep it, if the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions, I obviously need help. I realize that I don't have what it takes. I can will it, but I can't do it. I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad, but then I do it anyway. My decisions, such as they are, don't result in actions. Something has gone wrong deep within me and gets the better of me every time. The author, again, of this translation is something, saying something simpler to understand. We fight within ourselves the battle of sin. But when I fail to do what I want, which is obedience, and end up doing what I hate, which is sin, then I prove my need for God's law and command guiding me to do what is necessary and right. The law is good because it teaches me right and wrong. And I'm the one who fails the law. And that what, what Paul is going to get to is that is why we need grace. Because we fail. When sin is my master, it drives me to do evil. My flesh is wicked. Longing the lust of flesh and sin. 
my desires to be God's child and be obedient, but my flesh fails me and my sin leads my body to do what I do not want to do. But there is a transition that occurs. Once the law enlightens my sin and I commit sin, then I have begun to consent to sin and I am falling short. Now, please don't misunderstand what Paul is saying. He is not saying we are inherently evil or predestined to sin. He is saying that we fall short of God's glory, that when presented with the choice, even though we may choose in our minds not to do something, our body, our actions often go against what we have chosen. Our choice is often wrong. Again, it goes back uh, to that idea of a chocolate bar, that what we might say, well, I'm not going to eat that. The more it's in front of us, the more it's before us, well, the more easy it is to choose to eat that the easier it has become to do what is wrong. And that's what sin is. That while we might choose not to do it in the moment, well, what happens when that next moment presents the very same choice? What happens when our our actions are just whittled down until that just becomes second nature? We have the desire to do what is right, but yet our body, our flesh fails us. And that's what Paul is saying here. But then he goes on to tell us what can help us. If you'll look with me in verse 21, Paul tells us that our delight needs to be in the law of God. In verse 21, he says this. So I find it a law that when I do want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God, my inner being. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. Paul wants us to know that when we try to overcome sin, we have to have the proper focus in place. To close out this chapter, he tells us that we must find delight in the law of God. And he begins this point by telling us that when we want to do what is evil or right, evil lies in wait. He even calls this a law because it is something we guarantee. This is an idea mentioned in other apostles' letters, specifically about how Satan lies in wait to attack God's children. Because we're focused on doing right. That's our goal. That's our idea of of what we need to be doing. Evil is going to be looking for an opportunity. Satan's lying at the door, seizing his chance when he'll get it. We must be vigilant because sin and evil is lying at the door, waiting to creep in and waiting to overtake us. And that is a law. That is something we can guarantee, as Paul says, says. Paul then tells us that there is war waging within the physical body. My heart seeks God and his will, but my flesh fights my heart and wars within me. We can think about how this feels or looks in our lives. That constant battle between the right and wrong. The feeling of of being pulled towards sin and our conscience telling us not to do something rather than doing something. Paul tells us that while our mind might be thinking of doing God's will, while our heart is set on doing that, My flesh is fighting me. And Paul even cries out to God for help. We cannot do it ourselves. So we have to turn to the one who can. And that's where he finally just says, but thanks be to God, because God does help our plight. He strengthens and guides us. That we are wretched and sinful and wicked, but God has the grace that he gives. And that is the free gift he gives us through baptism, through our our reconciliation with Jesus in our death. He saves us and brings us home. He forgives us and gives us grace. And thanks be to God. That's why we need the new law. That's why we need this this new testament that has been given to us. Because we cannot keep the law ourselves. We fail and fail. So what applications can we take from this chapter? Well, really there are just a few. Firstly, the old law no longer binds us thanks to Jesus. Thanks to Jesus, the old law has been put to death. We have died with him. And much like a marriage where one one party dies, the other is free to, to remarry, the law has been put away. There has been a death for all so that we don't aren't binded by the, the law of the old Testament and have to deal with its, its limitations or rather our limitations to keep it. Secondly, we have to understand in a repeated fashion that the law serves to show sin to be sin. That's what we get when we read through God's word. That the law is being shown, or or the law is showing us where we have gone wrong, where we have fallen short of God's glory, and why we need his help. Thirdly, my mind may be willing, but my flesh is weak. This is an idea that we probably all understand too well. 
that we set ourselves to do what is right, but all of a sudden we find ourselves sinning. We find ourselves falling short of God's glory because we can't control ourselves and we need his help. We set our minds to do what is right, yet our body wars within us and wages against us. And ultimately, that is why God gives grace to forgive our flesh. That is why we need God's forgiveness because we cannot do ourselves, do it ourselves. And we need him to extend grace and forgiveness so that we do have the opportunity at salvation in the end. Chapter eight, 7 is difficult to understand at times. It's confusing in how he words things and how he writes things. But hopefully this has helped shed some light on what he's saying. Next week, we'll look at chapter 8 and see what he expounds upon him on the spirit and its role in our lives. But until then, I hope you have a blessed week. I hope you'll join us on Sunday as we worship together. Hopefully, we'll see you soon.